Today we're going to be talking about disorders of the spine that be, can be corrected by minimally invasive surgical approaches. And to help me, I have my good friend, Susan Keith here once again. Susan, thank you for being here yet again. Fine, I, I don't really, I can't really help a doctor. Well, what you're going to help me with is to explain and understand what the disorders are in the spine that we treat with minimally invasive surgery. We had a segment in which I described the surgical approaches and we had a segment even where we had a patient who'd undergone surgery in a minimally invasive approach. So we're going to talk about some of the disorders that require surgery and that may be benefited by minimally invasive approaches. Good. And when you have questions, speak up because that's right. why you're yeah, here. Yeah, I'm real curious. So there are a whole variety of disorders of the lumbar spine, ranging from fractures of the spine to tumors in the spine to degenerative changes in the spine to acute changes related <laughs> You're to scaring me. <laughs> this is like, ooh. Well, you know, 80% of the population has a back problem at some time in their life that they seek medical attention for. What percentage actually need surgery? surgery? Less than 5%. Oh, so don't be scared, because so if you've got a back problem, if someone's told you that you have a degenerated disc or some arthritis of the joints in the back, don't be immediately frightened that you need surgery, because most of the time you won't need surgery. And I understand you're so, pretty good at telling the difference. You're not like knife crazy. Well, my job is to be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and then but I've had people come up to me when we're like, uh, when we were down hearing jazz at the riverfront, right. and they would come up to him. You know, we were just sitting on our blanket with my doggies and stuff, and they'd say, "Oh, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you, but Eddie, you're the best. You really changed my life." Well, you know? it's certainly gratifying when someone comes up. It impresses to you that way. me too, and and that's wow. what well. That's what I hope the, the ultimate result is when a patient comes in and the majority don't need surgery and they thank me for not needing surgery. Yeah, and like my husband. Like your husband. And hopefully he won't require surgery. He's on his back anyway. He's had other surgery. But um, Yeah, but you, just, you were the one that discovered that it was his hip and not the back. Well, that's and now another he's thing doing so much that, better. that we're able to differentiate and that's why people should come to a board certified specialist to understand what the problems are. So let's talk about okay. some of the problems of the spine that do require surgery and what, what minimally invasive procedures we can utilize. So okay. for that, we're gonna have my friend here, Lurch, help <laughs> us out with. So we have here the lower back. We're gonna talk about minimally invasive surgery of the lumbar spine. Okay. We have the spinous processes to which all the muscles attach, which allow for movement. We have the roof of the spine called the lamina, and we have the facet joints. The facet joints are where the movement actually occurs. And what's the Swiss cheesy one down there? This is the sacrum or tailbone. Okay. And uh, it's just a modified vertebra. Each of these segments is one vertebra, and they all together make up the vertebral column or spinal column. In the front, we have the building blocks of the spine, the vertebral bodies, and the cushions in between are the discs. And and that's like when you said it's absorbers. like like the tempur mattress. Right, and they compress nice and re-expand. And expand, exactly. but when they don't, that's when you're in trouble. When they don't, that's when you can be in trouble. You're not necessarily in trouble. Most people do have degeneration of the discs over time, and it doesn't necessarily lead to any significant limitations. But okay. there are times when it does. So you have the joints of the lumbar spine that allow movement. And then here you have the vertebral bodies, which are the building blocks of the spine. And you have the discs in between that are the cushions, as we talked about, that mm -hmm. compress and re-expand. Yeah. If a disc is degenerating, it doesn't necessarily cause symptoms. It doesn't necessarily require that you need surgery. Most of the time it doesn't. Most people have some degenerative changes and they don't have significant symptoms related to it and don't need specific treatment. I think the most important thing about the spine to think about is that from a young age, from childhood, the proper mechanics of the spine should be taught and the proper way to maintain the muscles and strengthen the muscles, which then reduces the likelihood 
that there will be significant disc deterioration resulting in problems that could then require surgery. So that's why we're taught in school not to pull the chair out from underneath somebody and think it's really funny well, or jump on somebody's back. Those are pretty obvious, but I'm talking about really much more specific. What do, what do you do with the kids? that? Well, they should be taught how to... You, how to move, how to utilize their spine. There, there are educational programs that teach people really from a young age how they can move their body, how to hold their body in space. That's a whole different topic that we'll talk okay, about in another, another educational one. video. Okay. But we're going to talk about disorders that do when require surgery. When something's already happened. So if you have a fracture that's unstable, meaning if the joints are fractured, for instance, or if a vertebral body is crushed and a portion of it is pushing into the spinal canal, you might need surgery. Okay. If you've got a tumor in the spine and it's destroying some of the bone, you may need surgery to stabilize the spine. So you can take, there are tumors that grow, it's not just herniated discs? Well, anything can occur in the spine, right? Infections, tumors, wow. uh, just as in any other part of the body. Uh -huh. So if there are tumors, then sometimes surgery is required. Um, I just didn't know but tumors grew on bones. Tumors, metastatic tumors often occur in bones. When you oh, have so. breast cancer, when you have prostate cancer, when you have lung cancer, very often it goes to the bones. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the bones. So right, right, there are right. many different cancers that can occur in the bones. And, and there are times, not every time, but there are times when you need to do surgery. Most commonly, we're operating on the spine for either a herniated disc or for changes in the ligaments and in the margins of joints related to degeneration that causes overgrowth of the bone and spurs. Everyone's heard of bone spurs. They can occur in the spine and then they can cause narrowing of the openings where the nerves come out and that has to be rectified. So let's talk about one specific problem because okay. we, we had a lovely patient come in on another segment to talk about her experience with her surgery. So we're going to talk about lumbar stenosis, which is a narrowing of the spinal canal. So in the center here, where the nerves come through, right. that area gets closed in because the disc deteriorates and pushes up in there because spurs form along the margins that push up because you get thickened ligaments that hold the joints together that grow into the canal. All of those things narrow the canal and the nerves start to get compressed. Right. So in a standard approach, the canal has to be opened. And what's done is the muscles are, and their tendon attachments to the spine are severed and the muscles are pulled over to expose this entire area. And then these lamina, what's then called a laminectomy, are removed to open up the spinal canal so the nerves are free. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing that, you are actually being quite destructive. You're separating out you're, you're pulling apart muscles, you're separating out the oh, tendons. Oh, you as you're, a doctor when, yeah, you you're, when you're doing the surgery, you're in, the, in that standard approach, you're, you're cutting tendons apart, you're pulling muscles apart that can be damaged for long term, and you're removing big segments of bone that expose the nerves to scar, which in the future can be a problem, and can lead to instability of the spine as well. So if we have an ability to get into the spine without all of that destruction or trauma, that would be great. That would be great. So we have those now, and they're being Since developed. When? It's been t about 10, 12 years now wow. that we've been really actively pursuing minimally invasive approaches in this country. I've been doing it now for about 12 years, starting with what's called an endoscopic microdiscectomy. I refer to it that way because we take a narrow tube come right down to the disc through a small opening in the skin, about two centimeters. We don't cut muscle, we just separate muscle. We come down, and if the disc herniation is off to the side, I don't have to remove any bone. I can come directly to the That's disc amazing. and pluck out that piece of disc. Will the, the um, fibers grow back together? The muscle fibers just come right back together because you're not cutting muscles. Great. Um, so so that, is the, that was sort of the first minimally invasive approach. But now you have stenosis. You need your spine to be opened up further. You can also do that through a tube or through a small retractor that exposes just this area. And then through the microscope, we can see this area. Right. And rather than move, remove all this bone, 
I can remove a wedge of bone here, and I can remove all that thickened ligament, and I can come across all through that small, through that small area, and make sure that all the nerves are freed here, without taking all the muscle down, without taking all the bone down, just a wedge of the bone. And even if necessary, the joint, sometimes the entire joint needs to be removed. Right. And the nerve is then free, and the nerves in the canal are free, and the stenosis is resolved through this small opening. But then we have to stabilize the spine, we have to fuse it. So when we take out the disc, which mm -hmm. is part of the problem, we can do it through a very small opening in the disc. So we can all do it, we can do all of that through that small tube. So what I use is a, is a system called OptiMesh, which is like putting in a sock through a tube. And then that sock is expanded once it's in the disc with a bone paste that immediately hardens and fills up that space and holds the disc space open. So what, it's like a balloon at the bottom. In a sense, that And you it's up. not air that you put in there, you put in the bone, bone paste. Bone paste. And what's the bone paste made of? It's made up of specially prepared donor bone, and you can add the patient's own bone to it as well. Wow. So it then keeps the disc space open and allows your bone to grow through it. There are also other devices that are cages that are more solid that you can put in, and then you can expand it once it's in the, once it's in the disc, so you can use a small opening as well. Then you have to stabilize it further. And you can now put screws directly into the spine using computer guidance. So you can take an image taken during surgery, computerized image, and you can put that in the computer and you can now off of that image direct screws. Right during that same, in same surgery. So just, through the same uh, surgery, yeah. you can put those screws in looking at the images and you can do it very safely through those very small openings, what are called percutaneous, because oh, it's through the skin. Percutaneous. So through that, oh, the opening, not that tube. You can use, you don't need that tube. You go through, just yeah. through the well, skin. Just while you're looking at that, you're able to do that. Right. And, and it's very safe that way. And that, those screws lock into place and stabilize the spine. You can also, through a small opening. What are the, you, the, the screws made of? They're and titanium, generally. Okay, so they're not, we're going to rust or no. get rid Okay. And then there's another way also that we can do, especially I like this in older patients where we, the bones tend to be more brittle and we don't necessarily want to put screws in. Again, through a very small incision where we have to remove only a very small amount of muscle, we can put clamps like this. These are interspinous stabilizers because they go between the spinous processes, clamp in and lock the spine in place that way. So these are minimal access procedures that allow for removal of discs, decompression of the nerves, re res resolution of a stenosis, all through small openings with minimal destruction of tissue. It's incredible. It's, it's not so scary this way. Well, this is part of the art of surgery. The so, art of <laughs> part surgery. Part of the art part of surgery. Yeah, that's it. So thanks for being here with us today to talk it's, about minimal It's been great to learn surgery. so much. And thank yeah. you all for watching. Uh, we hope that this was instructive to you and we hope that you watch other instructional videos about lumbar disorders and cervical disorders. I'm Dr. Ezreal Cornell. Thanks so much for watching.